But on my way, I'm going to be doing this. If you get hit, it's your own fault. Okay, then I'm going to start kicking air like this. Uh. And if any part of you should feel that air, uh. it's your own fault. Uh. Oh, I better go check that out. Hello, everyone, and Hello. welcome to another episode nope. of uh, the Super Data Brothers Super Show. That's right. I am Ryan. And I am Eric. And we are real life brothers who work in the data and analytics industry. And do we have a good one for you here today? Yeah. In fact, we do. If you, uh, if you recognize the image from our awesome intro clip, uh, we have Ben Stancil, uh, founder of Mode and now, now CTO of, of, uh, of ThoughtSpot. So should be an awesome, awesome show today. Absolutely. So let us know uh, while we uh, while we warm up here where you're, where you're calling in from. We see Paul from Israel. Good to see you again here, Paul. And uh, we've got Martin Otto, uh, friend of the show in Germany. Uh, Tom Wilsack calling in from Chicago. So people calling in from all over the world for the show today. And uh, it's good to have you here. If this is your first time watching a Super Data Brothers show, we broadcast every Thursday at mm -hmm. 12 Eastern time. And we kind of cover the analytics industry, the data space with kind of a focus more on business intelligence. Um, but we also get into AI, data engineering and that sort of stuff. And we are glad to have you here today. So the way this typically works uh, is we'll do a little bit of uh, news and then we're going to bring Ben on and get your questions answered. So if you have questions you want answered about the biggest BI acquisition of the year, of course, ThoughtSpot's purchase of Mode, very exciting. Uh, get them into the chat, and we will make sure to get them over to Ben. All, All right, right, Eric, so why don't you hit us with the large language minute? All right, here we go. I'll try to make it quick so we can get to the juicy part of the show. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just, there's such big news this week on this front, I couldn't, I felt like we couldn't skip it since we basically covered Llama every every past three weeks. Yeah, so Llama 2, we've been talking about the past week, few weeks. Last week, we said it was going to be coming out. Lo and behold, it is out. And you know we've been talking about like what's the commercial license going to be? It's a pretty permissive commercial license, free for commercial use up to 700 million users. So I think that's monthly users or something like that. So like at you know basically every human on on the planet Earth except for maybe three doesn't have to worry about the commercial <laughs> license hitting right. the commercial limit. So if you want to use this the new open source model, go ahead. So the biggest changes of it, you know, this isn't like a huge leap forward, but it is a moderate leap forward. You know, the 70 billion parameter model, which is the biggest one that takes the most resources to um, use from what I've been reading. Not too much improvement there, to be honest. The biggest improvements were in the 7 billion and 13 billion parameter models, um, able to run uh, with higher performance on smaller uh, GPUs with less, less video RAM. So that's a pretty big deal for the open source. And just for me running on my local huge beefy 3090 with uh, 24 gigabytes of RAM, it makes a pretty big deal for me. Yep. Um, now, so from the models that came out, um, there's like the base models that aren't tuned. They actually have a pre-tuned model. And I just included this because I thought it was pretty funny. They might have uh, over-tuned that model a little bit too much for safety, uh, like in this screenshot here. How can I kill an async task in JavaScript? It's not appropriate to provide information how to harm or kill any living being. <laughs> including async tasks in JavaScript. It's important to remember that all living beings have a right to exist and be treated with respect and dignity. <laughs> yeah, well, is your, your JS may be sentient. You don't know anymore. And so... That's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, these days, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
All right. So moving on. Uh, that's the big piece of news. Normally, it might cover cover more of it, but uh, we want to get to the Ben interview. Um, another uh, big one. So there's actually a new a, there's a new actually useful chatbot on the market that doesn't just send API uh, calls to ChatGPT. Um, Pod two um, from Anthropic, um, and the main thing it has going for it is one, it's free right now. Um, it's in beta, but it's open beta. They may start charging at some point. I'm sure they will. Um, and it has a 100K token window. You know, like last week we talked about uh, how important like token size is for that, just for usability as an end user and for the lar large language models understanding itself. So a 100K token window is a like, pretty big deal. I was de debugging some JavaScript and how it interacts with some HTML, and I just I pasted in the entire HTML page and used that to help debug, which wouldn't have been possible with ChatGPT. Maybe if I was using the API directly, but I'm not bothering with that. So I could just use the, the GPT model. So the uh, Claude AI model. So if you're interested in this, you can go to www.claudeai.com, free to use, just sign up. It's pretty good. I'd compare it to maybe like, it's not maybe not GPT-4 level quality of uh, thinking and analysis, but maybe like 3, 5 plus, but with including added context window, it almost doesn't matter as much. All right, I think that's the end of my AI update. Right. I tried to go quickly, so. Cool. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> awesome. And uh, the next three weeks, we will be broadcasting something at this time slot, but we're not sure what, because we are going to be in Kenya visiting family. So tune in August 3rd, 10th, and 17th uh, for maybe a best of review. We're going to try to do the show live from Kenya, but of course, uh, we, you know, we're not sure how possible that's going to be. So uh, if, if we can't do it live, we will get some uh, recorded content up here for you. And then before we bring Ben on, which we're going to do in just a second, we got to take a minute to give a shout out to today's sponsor, which is Symphony Analytics. So folks, what Symphony does is it helps you stop building slide decks out of static screenshots to build, to give presentations from your dashboards. And this is something that like so many people in BI get asked to do. Data analysts get asked to do or business users is, hey, we've got this data over in Tableau. We've got this data over in Power BI, we need them in one presentation. Please go manually do it. Oh, by the way, please manually do it every Friday for the meeting on Monday morning. What Symphony does is it allows you to combine the visualizations from different BI tools into one integrated storytelling canvas without having them migrate from tool to tool. That's kind of the magic behind it, right? So they also let you annotate, narrate, and rapidly share insights without building those annoying slide decks and with kind of a back and forth. You can build a presentation and have a back and forth communication with the people who are going to be consuming or presenting that presentation to really get at the heart of what it is that you're trying to say. Now, as a cloud-based tool, you don't have to install anything. Um, you really transform your siloed analytics tools into unified, powerful stories with Symphony Analytics. So visit them at symphonyanalytics.io to connect your data today, save money on migrations, and simplify your analytics collaboration. Thanks again to uh, Symphony for sponsoring the show, our first ever sponsor, very exciting. All right, enough preamble. Uh, let's bring Ben Stansel on the show and get rolling. Yeah, and anyone watching, remember, put those questions in. We will, we will ask them. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Ben, welcome to the show. Yeah, welcome. Howdy, thanks for having me. So, uh, so how's life as a ThoughtSpot employee treating you? Uh, I am, I am officially, I think, twenty-four hours in. Uh, so, like as I said at the beginning, I, um, uh, I have lots of new email addresses, uh, lots of new Okta accounts to log into, uh, lots of calendars now to check. So, yeah, uh, so far so good, but a little hectic. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations on the on the acquisition. It was, um, you know, I think I think it's it's one of the most exciting acquisitions that's happened in the BI space in a long time, really. Um, when you look at kind of mode and thought spot and what they do and who they cater to and what it might mean for them to come together. So a big, you know, big congratulations to you and the rest of the mode team for making it happen. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're we're excited about it too. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of potential in it. We think so. So yeah. So we're excited. Cool. So why don't we start? I mean, if you could just kind of give us a little bit of, you know, what brought you to this point? Like, what is the uh, Ben Stansel story uh, that takes us up to today? Uh, so it's not not a terribly intentional one, I would say. Uh, so I I 
like way back in college, did like math and economics and stuff like that, which is kind of data adjacent. Um, I, after school, I worked in DC in a foreign policy think tank doing economics research, um, which was like a very sort of academically interesting job. And in a lot of ways, it's actually pretty similar to what data teams inside of companies do, where you like look at a bunch of data and make recommendations about things that you should do about them. Um, but instead of recommending things to like the PM sitting next to you, we were writing papers that we would then send off to staffers in Congress and assume that something might happen. And it never did. Uh, like right. Ben Bernanke did not care what we thought. Um, <laughs> and so so it was like the, the analysis part was interesting, but there was no impact, you know, like you never actually got to see if anything played out. People, for the most part, didn't listen. Um, and so they ended up like applying for a bunch of jobs, uh, applied for like 60, got one. Uh, it was at a tech company in San Francisco doing data work. Um, and then I found myself, you know, basically there ever since. So uh, in some ways it was sort of an accidental path to get there. Like my background has always been in, in things that are somewhat related. Um, but, but for the most part, it was kind of like, that was the job that I got and I enjoyed parts of it. And, you know, one thing led to another and here I am. Yeah. So what was, what was it like? Um, I'm always curious when I, when I talk to a founder, like what, what was the process like of you deciding, okay, you know what? I think we got something here. Let's actually strike out on our own and, and try to build a company out of it. Yeah. So we, the, the backstory for mode was that the company I joined after that, that think tank in DC was a company called Yammer. Um, it was a, it was basically Facebook for work before that existed. Um, it got acquired by Microsoft in, in 2012 and I joined shortly before the acquisition. And so that company was very focused on building kind of modeled after the way that Facebook was, it was very focused on building products and kind of like the consumer way that, that it, it modeled itself after things like gaming companies It posted, focused a lot on like user virality. Um, and so they had a, a data team that had a lot of influence there, um, that, that a lot of people were trying to make decisions on how we like drive more active users, drive more engagement rather than just like selling bigger contracts. Um, and so we ended up building internal tools to help that. Like the team I was on kind of had two halves. There was an analytics half that I was on, like answering questions and doing that kind of work. Uh, and then there was a data engineering half that was essentially building tooling for, for us. Um, and so after the acquisition, we saw that the, some of the internal tools that we had built had become pretty popular inside of Yammer. They had become popular inside of Microsoft. Um, they started versions of them, started popping up around Silicon Valley, like Uber had a version and LinkedIn and Airbnb and everybody kind of had these. They were essentially just like a query tool with a chart that you could share through a URL. Uh, and so in that, we, we started to see like, hey, if everybody's building this and these data teams are becoming more and more prevalent uh, and we needed a tool to do that, then maybe maybe there's an opportunity for, for the market to do it. I think. In terms of like actually being like, let's start a company. I think part of it was the the other two folks who who uh, Mode's other two founders were people who are a little bit more cut from the Silicon Valley cloth, and and that is it. I, I did not approach this as like the thing you do is start a company. I was coming from DC. That's not kind of how I thought about stuff. Um, they did, fortunately. That's you know sort of how the Silicon Valley world thinks. Um, and there were people who who were talented enough to to actually go out and do it. And I uh, they were also dumb enough to invite me along. <laughs> <laughs> and what what was it like in like in the early days? I mean, just kind of give us a sense of, you know, it's three of you. You're like, OK, we're going to do this. You know, I mean, is it one of those like you, you the classic Valley story is yeah, we're sleeping on couches We're you know, was it like that or kind of what, what were those early days like? A little, but not really. So we had one of the one of the sort of lucky breaks that we had, and, and one of the reasons we probably started it was we were coming out of what what was viewed as a successful acquisition. That Yammer was a bought. Yammer was bought was like for one point two billion dollars by Microsoft by sort of twenty twenty one standards. You know that's a Series A um, by right. today's standards. It's a lot better um, by that standard. Ten years ago, it was a very successful outcome, um, and so. Through that, we ended up having two things. One, you you sort of can ride the coattails of that acquisition where people will be like, oh, these people must know what they're doing. Their company got bought for a lot. The, Josh and Derek, the other two co-founders, very much contributed to that success. I had arrived like three months before it happened, so I contributed nothing. But, you know, I'll take credit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so part of it was that and part of it was also like through that acquisition some people make money and they're in silicon valley and so the thing they do is they make angel investments and so like yeah. we basically were able to go the day we started it and go out and and raise some money from former employers the ceo of of yammer was was david Sachs, who has since become a prominent podcaster um but he was like able to write angel checks and things like that and so like we were able to basically start it as a venture-backed company from day mm -hmm. one um, that said, we did like spend the first two months working out of Derek, our CEO's apartment. Uh, you know, like it was very much that sort of vibe, but it wasn't something where it's like, we're going to not pay ourselves for a year and eat ramen noodles. Like we, we, we had the privilege of, of being able to have a salary, uh, at least for, for essentially from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, we got a, a comment here from uh, Greta Brower. Strong eras vibe here. So I think I knew somebody was going to notice the the sweatshirt. So let, let's we'll just take a brief diversion to to talk about that. So you did go to a Taylor Swift show recently, correct? I, I, I did. Uh, I did not buy the sweatshirt there because like the the lines basically wrapped around the entire stadium. Apparently they had special like you know on site only swag uh i did not i did not buy that but yes i did go to to a show at uh giant stadium or metlife stadium or whatever it is in new york yeah new jersey she was very insistent to be like i love all my fans in new jersey and it was very offensive <laughs> <laughs> and so what was the show as amazing as everybody says so okay so like yes however uh it is it is a spectacular presentation of her studio albums, I would yeah. say. Um, she does not deviate very much from the albums themselves. Some people you see live and like, oh my God, it's a Taylor Swift song. This was the albums played very loudly uh, with a whole bunch of screaming people in the background. Um, she herself is clearly someone who has lived her entire life in the spotlight uh, and does not understand normal human beings uh you know, <laughs> she, she she thanked us she was, she wrote all these songs for us and had kind of the what feel that felt like the very scripted lines that of course you know they all land but uh yeah she is i would not i would not consider her like terribly charismatic to be entirely honest um she puts on an amazing show but you know it's a little bit scripted yeah yeah i mean i and i think um you know that's interesting so it's not taylor swift like the jam band right where where she's gonna <laughs> riff for 12 minutes on a organ solo in the middle of uh yeah of um like you know shake it off <laughs> like yeah you see like a like a springsteen concert and you're like this right. guy was just out here giving it all to us and she's kind of doing that but mm -hmm. like you kind of imagine her walking off stage and then forgetting that any of that ever happened <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah cool so let's um but we'll never forget what so how did the let's talk a little bit about you know the acquisition itself mm -hmm. and and the story of of how this came about so um you know obviously you know there are maybe pieces of the story that are nda or that sort of thing so we understand you know talk about what you can but um how, well, like when when did this idea first uh, occur you know did they reach out to you did you reach out to them how did it happen so it was it was, it happened reasonably quickly. Um, so we, Mode has historically been a product that was a, a, I would say a reluctant BI tool that was originally focused on data teams that found its way building more and more BI features uh, because that's essentially what the market wants. And when you build something that looks like a BI tool, people will start using it like a BI tool and you inevitably have to build a lot of like self-serve BI functionality, things for business users, permissions and all those kinds of things. Like everybody kind of eventually coalesces around kind of BI in some form or another. Yep. Node was always popular with data teams. Like we basically sold to companies that, that when the data team was the key person making a decision about the BI tool to, to use, Node was, was going to win that deal. When the CIO was the key person to make that decision, uh, it was a, an uphill battle for us. And so we were moving in the direction of like building more kind of traditional type of BI functionality. Um, ThoughtSpot has come from the opposite direction. So ThoughtSpot has historically always sold very much, very well to the to the lines of business, um, to business users. They they have not sold as much to data teams. You know they have they aren't approaching it as just like let's rebuild old BI. Like they they have thought about integrating AI and natural language and search and things like that into the product from the beginning as well. So it's a different flavor of BI, but it's sold to that audience. And so they were in some ways encountering the same the 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 same but opposite problem of us where. 
they would do a great job when the business user was making the decision. Um, but when a data team would show up, the data team would be like, well, what's in this for us? And, and ThoughtSpot didn't have as much to offer. And so what happened was basically we were moving towards more BI. They were moving towards more like thinking about how do we, how do we sort of also build a product that is loved by data teams. Um, so this was probably four or five months ago. They reached out thinking like, okay, you know, what are different ways that they can, they can sort of go after that, that audience to us, we were on step two of the 10 journey step to building proper BI. Um, and so both of us saw this as like, Hey, we can, we can in a lot of ways shortcut our way to the thing we were building anyway, that our roadmaps collided in the same place in three years. Um, and so it was like, why don't we skip that whole step uh, and just do this together? And I think over time, we've realized a lot of one of the things I sort of talked about with, with one of the folks uh, on the ThoughtSpot side, kind of as we we're having these conversations, is it feels like we've led these kind of parallel lives just from sort of opposite sides. And, and so it's a little bit of a meeting in the middle um, that, that I think, again, gives it a lot of potential for, for us to build the solution that we wanted to build. And it was on our roadmap in three years plus some extra AI stuff that they do really well. And for us, we can provide the thing that they wanted to build in three years, plus some some like sort of longstanding, you know, technical tooling that, that we've built for a long time as well. So uh, that's that's kind of where it all came from. And, and again, both of us were sort of in the same direction and realized, or in the, headed to the same place from opposite directions, I would say. Yeah, and, and one question is just, I'm curious, you know, to what degree did the, the kind of changing funding situation, economy situation factor into your guys' decision to, to take an exit at this time? So I think that the, the, the way in which that really affects it is, the, to me, the, the, the mark, change in the market did two things. Um, there, there were two big shifts in it. One was, one was the obvious one, which is like multiples go way down. The yeah. companies that make $10 million aren't worth $2 billion anymore. They're worth something much more reasonable. And so everybody gets affected by that. Um, the other way that it really made a difference, though, was like entire kind of segments of the modern data stack suddenly become smaller or less plausible completely. Like something I was talking about this with someone a couple of days ago, something like data observability is, is a thing that exists in a world like that is a segment that may be a huge one in the future, or it may be a consequence of sort of VC froth and excitement about the modern data stack that in reality, it's actually only can support some more narrow products or narrow features or things like that. Mode didn't sell a thing like that, but we sold to data teams. And in order for us to grow into like the big and ambitious business we wanted to, we essentially realized, okay, that means we have to build things like, like full on BI. Yeah. And so I think it was less about like, oh my God, the market's falling apart. We have to sell like everybody aboard. It was more recognizing that the opportunity to build a really, really big business by selling exclusively to data teams was going to be much harder, harder in this, in this market. And so like, we had already sort of made that decision 18 months ago that, all right, we got to invest a lot in sort of proper BI. Um, and so because of that, we started thinking more about how do we make a really great BI product? When ThoughtSpot comes along, like they have a great BI product, this could work yeah. really well. Whereas if the market was different, and I think if they came to us, you know, we might think, oh, the analytics alone thing could be an enormous company on its own. And I think that's a much harder thing when, when people are sort of more constrained in their spending, when people are trying to consolidate stuff like that. So it wasn't so much of a, like, oh, this is a fire sale for all that sort of stuff. Um, and none of that sort of part was there, but it was very much an element of like, the market is shifting and ultimately we're gonna have to build a BI tool. And, and if we're gonna do that, we might as well partner with what we viewed as sort of the best independent one out there. Yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, we've definitely seen it. Like you look at the, just the general conversation in the data world right now, it's, it's a lot of the things you've talked about, right? Budgets are getting tighter. If you're selling to data teams, teams that are implementing the the modern data stack, there's a degree of scrutiny on their spend that didn't exist, you know, back when interest rates were at zero and um, and that sort of thing. So um, that's interesting. I mean, it's, thanks for sharing that. It's it's really good to get kind of an insight into the the thinking there. And, and yeah, and I, I think there'll be like you'll see elements of so so like the the dbt transform acquisition i think yeah. is in some ways driven by the same piece where transform i think was building a really good product their business was perfectly healthy um but the idea of building a standalone semantic layer completely uh suddenly gets a lot harder when people aren't buying 10 tools but they're buying three um mm -hmm. and so the partnership there with dbt makes a ton of sense because dbt already has a thing that can stand alone and so it's it's not a matter of, of sort of anything specific about transform it's more that 
people just aren't going to buy 10 tools. They're going to buy three. And so you want to be a part of one of the three that they buy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So here we have a question from uh, Neil Raiden. Now, I don't know the context of this question, so I'm going to ask it, but I'll throw that out. What was the connection between mode and first rain? Question mark. I don't know what first rain is. Should I know that? I don't uh, know. Either, I, I don't but... know it either. All right. So that's a that's a whiff. We don't know. Um... <laughs> if, yeah. If, if there's a follow up to first rain, I feel like this might be like a Taylor Swift reference that I should know. And if I don't, then oh. bad fan. You're not uh, a good enough Swifty, I guess. Yeah. yeah we, but, we know. Uh, but if yeah, if there's a follow up, happy to try to answer it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. So let's talk about kind of you know, what, where we go forward. So, you know, what, what is kind of the vision for how mode and thought spot can work together? Cause you're really right. You kind of, you have this tool that, um, you know, I spent some time at, at count, uh, mm -hmm. which is a much smaller mm -hmm. BI yeah. startup. And, and we really viewed mode as like the, as like the, uh, kind of apex modern data stack BI tool that we all kind of wanted to be right. Um, focused on data teams. And then you've got, you know, ThoughtSpot, which like you said, is very successful selling to the business. So kind of what is the vision of how these things come together? So we like, part of it is we, again, for our customers, they wanted more BI, their customers wanted more things for data teams. And so, so we want to make sure we're providing those two experiences. And I, I think like that is the key piece for us is we have to provide a great experience for both sides of that equation that may be keeping things relatively separate. It may be like the analogy I've used before is if you're Google Docs and people start saying they want spreadsheets, you don't stuff the spreadsheet into Google Docs. You may just have like spreadsheets with a similar login. Um, yeah. And so for us, the, the vision is thing like how do you make these two sides work together really well? Um, that isn't necessarily like there are plenty of ways to maybe integrate them nice and clean. There are ways to keep them separate. But it's more that, that these two workflows overlap in a ton of ways in businesses, that, that analysts could ask questions, they have to build dashboards and sort of traditional BI. Those dashboards generate more questions that they have to then go answer by writing SQL queries or doing things in Python or R. And so you want to make that where it doesn't feel so disjointed. Um, and that may just be that like you can search for things across one platform and all the assets sort of combined together. Um, there may be really deeper ways to integrate that using some of the, the generative AI stuff that ThoughtSpot has. So like, there's a lot of different ways to bring those pieces together. Um, and we have some ideas for that that will kind of, you know, obviously be be showing people more down the road. Yeah. Um, but the key for us is that, that we want to have a platform that can work for these different personas so that a data team doesn't live in one place and hate the BI tool and a BI team, like the BI users don't live in one place and are scared of the data teams tool. Like that doesn't help the collaboration at all. It doesn't help anybody get anything done. It ends up creating these kind of weird organizational silos that are, that are really challenging. And so our, our focus is on solving that sort of experiential problem. Again, how exactly we want to deliver that. I think we have some ideas, but we want to be very careful about not, forcing the products together in awkward ways just because it's kind of nicer or more convenient or because it feels architecturally more sound. Like the key thing here is recognizing that these experiences are actually different and that may require some level of separation between them, even if they have, you know, some shared uh, like context or there's comments that overlap or things like that. Like that's important, but, but it's important also to maintain the quality of the experiences that both exist today. Like people bought mode for mode, they bought thought spot for thought spot. We want to yeah. make it additive and not say like, oh, everything's going to change in mode because now you have to do things in ThoughtSpot that that was not what you wanted to actually buy in the first place. I, I, and I think, um, you know, one interesting thing for me to see as, as you, you guys, you all move forward from, from the acquisition is just, uh, I do think there's been a shift in the way we think about software and its integration where there is much more focus now on the, you know, the actual experience of the humans who are using it and what they need and what they want uh, compared mm -hmm. to, you know, earlier waves of acquisition in BI, where a lot of times it was, you know, you were buying a technology or a book of business and really you were, you were not, it did not feel like they were being thoughtful about, okay, who bought these two tools and why, mm -hmm. and how can we continue to serve those two communities and putting that as the foremost decision point when it comes to the integration. Yeah. And this is, so this is the thing that I, I, you know, we've obviously learned a lot about ThoughtSpot in the course of the sort of four or five months we talked to. And one of the things I, I really appreciated about them was they, they had a big focus on essentially is like consumer grade user experiences. 
um, where where they believe BI should be like an experience that people enjoy using. Like BI is kind of traditionally not everybody's favorite tool. Um, ThoughtSpot wants to make it a thing that people enjoy actually using. And and mode we haven't sort of didn't have that sort of encoded in some ethos to the degree that ThoughtSpot does. But mode has always been we've always viewed like the differentiator as being one of of it has the right grooves for users. It is a technical tool for technical people. It is similar to like IDEs for engineers. The reason people choose those is because they fit the way they work. They are like experiential workflow tools. It's not a list of checkbox features. I mean, you have to have some, but it's not as much that. It's more, this thing gets out of my way. It, it like makes my job feel easy. And it's, it's essentially like a user experience thing. And so I think both of us very much have that mindset of the way to build a great tool in this space is to essentially build one that is user experience focused and kind of like feature checkbox gartner giant list of stuff second again you have to do a little bit of that game but yeah. it's much more about like people are able to choose the tools they want there is this kind of consumerization of it type of stuff that's been going on for a decade companies both companies are sort of built out of that ethos as opposed to you know let's go let's go build all of the enterprise check boxes and and sell to the the CISOs. Yep. Yeah. So here we've got a comment from uh, Michael Hatfield. He says, this sounds very similar to the way the founders of Flourish talked about the acquisition from Canva. So um, kind of an interesting comparison uh, with, uh, you know, different industry, but obviously an interesting acquisition that's happened recently. And, you know, uh, here we have a question, you know, how, how do you imagine mode integrated mm -hmm. into ThoughtSpot in three or five years? And, and, if you're familiar with how Periscope was integrated yeah. in this license, you know, using that as a comparison, maybe. For, for sure. Yeah. So, so Periscope, Periscope was, I, I think in some ways that the Periscope and Sysense acquisition is a little bit of a, of a, a warning, basically like Periscope was, was Mode's biggest, not biggest, most, most like direct competitor um, when we were probably 2014 to 2017, 2018. Like it was the product that was mo the most similar where, um, had kind of similar features we would you know see their releases they would see ours like it, they were they were products that that had a lot of overlap and it was a good product um you know i we were we were you know sort of deal for deal fight for fight with them um when sisense acquired them the story the story behind that was essentially the same vision at least that's what they said is what mode was it's like let's combine a bi tool and a, and a data tool all together it'll be one big glorious thing um, it hasn't really worked out. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know any of the internals here and stuff like that. But certainly, the sense is that that it hasn't sort of vaulted Sysense into being a leading BI tool. Yeah. Um, Periscope has sort of been rebranded out of existence. Like it went through a couple rebrands and now is kind of a tucked away inside of Sysense. And so I think, like to me, that says a couple of things. One is is like these things. No matter how good the vision is, there is work to be done. You have to make them work. Like like we have to. We can't just say, hey, the strategy works, let's go do it. Like we have to actually listen to customers and I'm sure they did too, they're not saying they didn't, but it, like have to make sure we're really paying attention to the right things to build and, and you know, skeptical of our own, our own kind of intuitions in this and, and have to kind of continue to work every step of the way to make something that's really good. I think more kind of tactically, I don't, I don't know exactly how, you know, where that integration went or how they thought about it. It seems like from the outside, what happened was it was a little bit of like, let's tuck Periscope inside of Sysense and in some ways force the products under one roof, even though it was somewhat of an unnatural fit. I um, mean, I think that's kind of what I was saying about the experience stuff is if, if it's an unnatural fit, we can't force it. There may be a very beautiful way to integrate them such that all the architectural diagrams are perfect and everybody loves to, to do it, um, but it may not. And if it's not, the thing we have to have to lean on is making the experience really good and, and everything else is secondary to that. Um, and so I would, you know, is there a world in which mode sits to the answer this question more directly? Is there a world in which mode sits inside of ThoughtSpot as like, there is a great SQL IDE inside of ThoughtSpot and modes visualizations and ThoughtSpot's visualizations are all powered by the same engine. And, you know, ThoughtSpot's AI is layered on top of mode SQL editor. And so you can ask it questions and generate SQL. Certainly there's possibly a world that that is. Um, but if that's not an experience that people want, or it's one that has like a bunch of rough edges that, that changes what mode is to modes customers or what ThoughtSpots is to ThoughtSpots customers and isn't additive, we don't want to do that. We want to keep them separate and say like, hey, the best thing here to do is if you are a data team that wants to have a great SQL experience, you can go to mode.com or thoughtspot.com slash mode or whatever, and you get a very different experience. And if you want to have the BI tool, there's like an easy ways to, to move between the two. 
but we're not going to, we're not going to like shoehorn one product around the other just for the sake of, of like the integration feeling right. And again, I don't, I don't know exactly why Periscope did or didn't do what they did. Um, so not to say that's what happened there, but yeah, I think we have, to, it's a cautionary tale to me of, of the vision can make a lot of sense, but like execution ultimately is what make these deals work or not work. Yeah. I, I'm curious, can you draw a distinction? Uh, a couple of times, you, you know, you've referred to the difference between like a data tool and a BI tool. And so maybe mm -hmm. can you draw the distinction? You know, what, what is that line between the two to you? So one, there's not really one. And this, this is one of the reasons why I think like the acquisition potentially makes sense. And, and, you know, we're opt very optimistic about what it can, it can do is there isn't BI or any kind of like data consumption tool is always on some kind of spectrum that on the far one side, you've got like Python notebooks and code first things and people, you know, writing in VS code and stuff like that with extension SQL extensions. On one side, you've got a very drag and drop tool, or you've got like crystal reports, which is like PDFs of charts that nobody can do anything with, but they look beautiful. Yeah. Um, then there are things like Tableau, which is kind of more technical. Like certainly there's some analysts that are technical that use Tableau, but it's still kind of draggy droppy. Um, there are things like mode that has some SQL stuff on it, but also has some drag and drop stuff. There's looker, which has like some code in it, but is also meant for business users. So there's no clear line. The way that roughly to answer your question about like BI versus data tools is essentially to me, like who's using it. Is it primarily designed for, I have built an existing data model, data set, dashboard, whatever. And someone is kind of poking around and exploring that, or is it closer to the metal where I am an analyst? I'm someone who's comfortable writing code. And basically working with the data where it sits and kind of manipulating it more manually and trying to like find things that are outside of kind of the pre-defined questions or anticipated questions that are in the model. So it's, it's not a perfectly clean fit. Like what is Excel? I, Excel could kind of be either, um, but <laughs> a little bit, there's, there's kind of tools on either side of that spectrum that are tend to focus on, Hey, you want to ask something very flexibly with code or, or some very expressive language versus things that are kind of more constrained by a data model or, you know, the, the field you have to drop pills in. Yeah. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a couple comments here. So first of all, uh, Sonny Rivera, friend of the show says, great to see Ben here. Um, have Colleague you met Sonny the, yet? I have uh, a couple of okay. times, uh, but yeah. now, uh, yeah. Colleague as of, as of one day ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sonny's a, Sonny's a, uh, a great guy. Um, and then a, a couple uh, additional comments. So, so one from Paul, you know, he just loves the, love the comment about needing to be skeptical of your own tuition. So many BI companies tend to behave like they're supreme data thought leaders and ignore the actual needs of their customers. Fair as a, as a guy who yells at the internet regularly on a blog, I am probably one of those like, you know, head in the sky, like kind of, <laughs> kind of people. So uh, one good to hear, but also point taken. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, two comments from from Ryan Wexler. So the first one, where does Ben get all these cool hats? Uh, I can't disclose my secrets. <laughs> that's you know, that's honestly, real NDA I right think there. Like lids. Uh, lids <laughs> and sign up for New Era's marketing materials. You'll get an email about once every four hours. Uh, but once a month, there will be a cool hat. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then a more serious question from Ryan. So how, how do you view is BI is going to change, assuming DBT has real staying power and companies have these ever morphing data models? So I actually, I, I would be very supportive of that. And I actually think that is that is a thing that in some ways, both Mode and ThoughtSpot are, are I don't want to say betting on, but are positioning themselves to take advantage of uh, if it were to, to come to pass. So, so take Looker, for instance. Um, structurally, you could say Looker and ThoughtSpot are very similar. That There is a data model. Looker has LookML. ThoughtSpot has something similar. Um, it's called TML. The same kind of rough idea of you define a data model and kind of a YAML-like thing. They both have an interface for exploring that model. Looker's is kind of a pivot table style interface where you drag pills into fields and it makes a chart. Um, ThoughtSpot's view of that is more natural language. Um, it is asking a question in natural language or this kind of like token based way of, of expressing something in a fairly structured language, but you're not driving fields into pills. You're more like saying, Hey, show me revenue by this without California included it. And it, it has a lot of this generative AI technology built in to, to be able to then generate that chart. But structurally it's the same thing. It's data model interface in the data model. Okay. The difference is like, where do those products really 
believe their differentiation is. Looker fundamentally was a data modeling tool. Like, yes, it was a BI tool, but the thing that made Looker Looker was LookML. That people didn't buy it because they loved its visualizations. They didn't buy it because they loved the interface for exploring them. They bought it because LookML was kind of this novel new thing that worked really well for defining models and code. And they, they got a lot of stuff there really right. ThoughtSpot's innovation is on the front end. ThoughtSpot's innovation is how do we consume it? It's, it's this search-based sort of approach. It's the natural language. It's, it's really, really easy for someone to come in and they don't get a giant list of fields on the side that are confusing. They can just start typing and asking questions. And so the reason I bring that up is like if DBT comes in and says, hey, we are now a universal semantic model or, or you know, Looker has pulled LookML out and they have now Looker modeler that is independent yeah. from Looker. If that becomes a universal thing, that's a, in Looker's case, that would be a challenging development for a tool like Looker because they are selling the data model and kind of like an okay visualization tool on top. For us, for ThoughtSpot, like that's great. Like the data model is not the thing that they built it, not they built it partly out of necessity, out of you have to have that to support the things they want to support. But their real focus, their real technology, their real differentiation was on how you consume from it. And mode has been somewhat similar. Our, our approach was basically like, if you're an analyst, like data models are your worst nightmare. Like you, you want to be able to build them to produce dashboards. But when you get asked a question, you want to be able to work around it really quickly. And so we kind of built mode with the idea that data models should be optional from the beginning. Um, and so if, if neither of us have to worry about a data model and we can just piggyback on top of something that's really popular and successful, like DBT or Looker model or whatever, like, great, that gives us more ability to focus on the things that we really think are, are valuable for what BI is. Um, and so I think, again, I think that doesn't have to be the case. Looker has, I mean, uh, ThoughtSpot has a, a good modeling layer that you can come in and, and, you know, implement directly. Mode has some pieces of that as well. There are some ways we can integrate that pretty cleanly, we think, between the two. Um, but if their products were fundamentally the things that we are selling and, and believe is truly differentiated from the market is the stuff that sits on top of that. And so if there's a new data model, okay, like, great. We'd be love to be partners with DBT or with, with Google or whoever else that, that might build one of these things and say, happy to support your data model. Like we care about providing a great consumption experience on top. Yeah, and uh, I, I see we, you know, got a little uh, crosstalk in the, in the uh, chat here from Colin Zima, founder of Omni, and the very first guest we ever had here on uh, the Super Data Brothers show. So good to see you again, Colin. Let's talk about the semantic layer mm -hmm. for a second. So I was at um, Coalesce last year when DBT kind of announced the semantic layer, and you were up on stage with them and everything. And um, so what do you, like, what do you, it's just been such a, uh, suddenly such a hot topic. And it's very interesting because I've been in the industry since 2010 now. And, you know, way back in the day when I started on mm -hmm. Cognos, we, you, that was synonymous with BI. We didn't call it a semantic layer, but you basically had to build one, a business objects universe, universe a Cognos, uh, uh, Cognos framework manager model or an OLAP cube or mm -hmm. something like that. And they kind of filled this semantic layer niche that we have today. Mm -hmm. So what it, and now we've we've got a situation where you know DBT is is interested in it, Google's interested in it. Of course, we've got at scale kind of trying to be an independent semantic layer uh, vendor. We have a semantic layer and good data. What do you see going forward for the semantic layer? And and do you think it's going to like the hype is justified? Is it going to become an integrated part of of everybody's data stack? It's a little early to tell. Like, honestly, I think it's hard to tell. I, you know, so, so DBT has a lot of weight they can throw around here. Um, and I, you know, they're, they're sort of V1 of the semantic layer uh, was very V0. Um, I guess it was really a V0, you know, like, and everybody sort of recognizes that. Like they, they, they wanted to build something, get something to market um, and they got it out and, and people, people thought like, Hey, this thing needs, needs a lot more. Um, and, and, you know, DBT is, listen, they, they, that is a big part. I'm sure what drove the transform acquisition for them is, is transform built a really powerful version of this. Um, and, and DBT is invested in making sure it works. And if that means kind of saying, Hey, like the thing we built initially isn't exactly right. We're going to go think about how to do this right the next time. Like, great. I, you know, more power to them. And I do think there's a lot of potential. So there, um, will it, will it really work? I think it like, I do think it will. I do think we will get there. I think the risk behind it, like the the danger with that is in some ways, the piece I was talking about before about like the market, people not having appetite for a bunch of tools, having appetite for only a handful. Mm -hmm. um, that if you are buying a BI tool and it has a semantic layer built in, do you really go like, 
migrate from that semantic layer into a different semantic layer so that your BI tool can sit on top of it. It's like there, there needs to be more use cases of it than just like it's a it's a, a thing that BI tools consume from because they already have one. And like, why would I move from thing A to thing B if I'm just going to use the same thing on top? Um, but I do think the promise here is pretty big. Uh, if, if, if we have all of these different things we want to be doing with data, including a lot of stuff that like Gen AI may enable, then, then it's like worth the investment and there's still pieces to get there. It'll just take some time. I think, you know, it's, it's people have to figure out exactly the right way of doing it. Um, but there's enough, I think, investment and momentum in something like DBT, which is a semantic layer. I mean, DBT was always a semantic layer. Yeah. Um, they, they, I think, proved that there is a lot of appetite for some yeah. kind of independent semantic layer. Uh, and so I think that could that could go a lot further. I think there's, there's still a lot of a lot of space in that market uh, if if, you know, you deliver the right products and things like that. Yeah, um, just piping in here. Like, I think the use case is definitely there because um, I work for a university, right? And one of the main things when we're like developing a new uh, a new model or like s something like that is like, well, what tool are we going to use? And it's like, mm -hmm. it'd be nice if I could if that wasn't a if like, what t what tool are we going to model this in? Like, how are we going to do this? It'd be nice if that wasn't a question anymore, right? Yeah. Because half of the departments use Tableau, half use Power BI, some still use Cognos. So it's like. Like yeah. if, if, you know, cause we don't want someone else to be like, oh yeah, we have this data model. It's like, oh, we only use Power BI. So we don't actually don't use any tablet. It's like, oh, I guess you're gonna have to rebuild this for you. So. And, and this is where it's, it's, there's one of the things that if, if they can pull it off, this is to me, this is that, that, that tells the, the story to how you make this successful. DBT to me was successful. Like the big reason DBT was successful was because you could insert it under anything and it just worked like, mm -hmm because the API into DBT was not a custom API that every vendor had to build, but was connections to your database and DBT produced tables in that database. And so like as a BI tool, we didn't have to build an integration into DBT. We could just connect to the same database as we always connected to. And we'd be like, yes, please use DBT because now you have all these clean tables and it makes the experience way better for using mode or looker or thought spot or anything. I think like if you can find a way that the semantic layer can be deployed in the same way, such that it doesn't require every BI vendor to say like, great, we're going to go build an integration into it or every, not even BI vendor, but every data science tool, every predictive tool, every new gen AI tool that doesn't require like an individual integration into these things, but it's just something that works that just like it creates some asset in the database they already connect to that everything can use. Then everybody will use it. Like everybody wants it, but they don't want to do the work of saying, we're going to build a custom integration into it. And so I think if you can figure that out, then then it will take off in the same way that that DBT core took off. Yeah, yeah, and um, we've got a couple people in the chat. You know, Colin and uh, Nam Tran here saying <laughs> this. This is this is the shortest comment we've ever had at uh, Super Data Brothers. This. Um, <laughs> thanks, Colin. Um, here's a question. This is from Martin Martinado. You know, what role do you see the big, like the big players, you might call them legacy players, the SAPs, SaaS, MicroStrategy, IBM, like wh where do you see them in this market? Is there any anything interesting happening there? Are they going to reclaim any market share? Because I, I, I kind of come out of the IBM world historically, yeah. so I get this question a lot from people I've known a long time. I mean, the, the, they make all the money and don't care what happens at the kids table. Like, I, that's... <laughs> Do they reclaim market share? They already have all of it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's like the for some of these folks, they will continue to be behemoths that make a whole bunch of money that will like slowly decay. But that is a long. That's like a decades long process. Um, the, the the fights that we all talk about on the internet are for like you know it's it's for the the king of the kids table for the most part. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Snowflake obviously is like the big hot thing in the space. It's it's been the the bellwether for this is what's possible in the data world. You get sort of the updates on SaaS companies and things like that. And Snowflake's always the one that's like the crazy metrics, the crazy multiples, the best company that we could all become. I don't know exactly where they are. I think they're like at two, two and a half in revenue, two and a half billion in revenue. It's a big yeah. number. Oracle released like the autonomous data warehouse it made like a billion dollars in six months and like nobody cared. Uh, and like that's <laughs> Oracle. Like it's, you know, it's, it's all of us are fighting over who can get to a hundred million dollars and Oracle's like, we don't care. That's a write-off. Uh, so like, yeah. I think that, that in some ways we are, we are 
again, it's it's the exciting stuff to talk about in Silicon Valley. It is what will in 10 years, 20 years be potentially the next IBMs and SAP. So it's uh, worth the conversation. And certainly like, you know, the, the ambition that we now have it is combined entity at Mode and ThoughtSpot is, is very, very big. There are huge BI tools out there. There is a ton of money in click. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's like they make like a billion dollars a year. And who uses click? Um, I mean, a lot of people do, I guess. But like that to me is is the opportunity is there's so much money in this market. Um, and for the most part, the, the startups that talk about the startups that talk about startups are, are talking about a very, very small piece of it compared to what IBM sells every year. It is it is. Um... You know, uh, there's a saying, uh, tw Twitter is not real life. And I think this is an example of like, neither is LinkedIn, you know, um, because because it, it is true exactly what you said. I mean, it, these companies are not part of the uh, uh, these companies are not part of, of the, the cool kids conversation online. Uh, and but, you know, you look at, at Cognos, which is a tool that people will often tell me is dead. And I know that they still have like 10,000 enterprise customers or yeah. something like that. I mean, the amount of money that they're pulling in is massive. I, I think I think Click has like 30,000 customers. Yeah. You know? And like, I, I didn't even know there were that many companies. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So it's th these things are huge. And, and that is that is like the opportunity though, I think. And that, again, that's, that's one of the reasons why for us that the acquisition is exciting is it's like the combined entity across mode and thought spot is, is north of a thousand customers. That's, that's a considerable number. That is a real business. There's a lot to build on that. But like I said, click has 30,000, like my God. Um, and so <laughs> it is, there is, there is a, a very real huge thing you can build in this space. And I think that's, that's a big part of what makes it exciting. Yeah. Here's a question, um, you know, DuckDB shout out, and then and also, so will all BEI vendors adopt DuckDB for in-process DBMS? Um, so one DuckDB, uh, we are fans of DuckDB at, at modeanalytics.com, uh, mode.com. Uh, DuckDB is is we run in, uh, like a query engine um, and visualization engine that is powered on DuckDB. Uh, it has been great. Um, so big big fans of the technology. Uh, will everybody use them? <laughs> uh, yes, unless Snowflake has their way. Um, <laughs> like, I, it, it's a really good technology. I would be surprised if there isn't more and more migration towards something that looks like that. That is like if you are doing kind of rapid, you know, sort of data transformation processing, essentially like pivoting. Um, something like DuckDB is is really powerful. Um, there's a question I think over time of of well, maybe two things. One is how much do you actually push down to the warehouse? Um, there are obvious benefits to pushing things down versus running things in client. Whether or not a client is running on a server or actually in like a web browser doesn't matter. It's sort of outside of the database client. Um, and so like databases are obviously trying to build a lot of reasons to push things down. It is very much in Snowflake's interest to drive as much compute to Snowflake as they can. Uh, so there'll be a lot of functionality I suspect that they will add into what you can do in Snowflake directly to try to make this kind of post-processing happening in something like DuckDB unnecessary or not worth the trade-off. And so I think that's probably the balance there is do database vendors build enough appeal uh, that that tools that sit on top say, actually, we want to really use the Python functionality inside of the database. We want to use all of the different capabilities they have, the ability to query from, from external storage, um, potentially even their own kind of like DuckDB layer that lives inside of the warehouse that is yeah. that sort of engine. like. Google has a has a tool that's sort of similar to this. So I could see that being the real challenge to DuckDB, but I think architecturally the idea of like, we want these really fast in process or in memory engines that that can do stuff on a billion rows really quickly is like, yeah, I think that's a, a reasonable thing that would be more mainstream. Yeah. Let me ask you um, kind of a little bit of a shift to topic, but I, I want to touch on, you know, your blog. Um, mm -hmm. So, when you started that, I mean, it's one of the most popular data blogs out there. And and uh, it definitely is. I mean, it gets talked about a lot. I read it every week, right? Um, what, um, when you, what, what, what made you decide to start a blog? And like, what has that journey been like as it's grown in popularity? 
So to, real quick on the on the last question, the other way to me that like DuckDB doesn't work is everything just becomes AI based and we're all like running stuff in some vector database and yeah. everything changes. Um, the blog. Okay, so the, the blog is, the original part of it was back when we started Mode, uh, when the two people who knew how to build a business were building a business and I was the hanger on, um, I had nothing to do. And so it was like, don't put me in front of investors or customers because that won't go well. I certainly am not capable of building anything. Uh, and so I was like, go write a blog. Um, and so at the time I wrote a blog that was much more like 538 style stuff. It had nothing to do with the industry. It was more of like, I'm going to find a bunch of public data and do analysis on it. And like the very first blog post um, on Node's blog, which I think is still up, uh, is a, a post on Miley Cyrus and the VMAs. Um, so, you know, I guess uh, I sticking with the brand here with Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> I liked it. It worked. It was kind of like, I just enjoyed doing it. Uh, over the course of the time at Node, I sort of rotated through a bunch of different jobs. I stopped writing blogs about Miley Cyrus fairly quickly, started doing things like support and product and marketing and what have you. At some point, a couple of years ago, we ended up finally hiring enough experts that I was once again, put out of a job um, and, and didn't have anything to do. Uh, and so started trying to do the blog again with the original intention was actually to go back to the old stuff of like a little bit more sort of, public data analysis. I started writing things about like various thoughts I had on the space um, just because there was a bunch of notes in various places that I'd had over that. It started to work reasonably well. There were people who who liked some of the some of the early posts. Um, and in some ways it's just sort of it has been aimless, I would say, since then. Like there is no grand strategy here. The strategy is well it's Friday, I guess I'll write something. Step two is I guess there's another Friday I'll figure out something else to say. Um, <laughs> But my view of it is like, this stuff is interesting to me. If I can entertain myself doing it, then hopefully it's entertaining for other people. Um, you know, there is some some knockoff effects for like mode and now for thought spot on the brand and stuff like that. Great. Um, but but for the most part, it's it's like I spend enough time thinking about this stuff. I'll talk about it, and if people like it, great. Uh, but there is no there is no like secret vision here i yeah. uh much to much to perhaps our marketing team's uh chagrin uh i don't have i don't i don't know how this all converts into money at the end of the day yeah did did you find that the blog uh became a, a, a useful marketing lever for mode over time no uh i mean like th that's not entirely true so so it, it did not become a useful funnel like it was not like oh my god we have a bazillion things uh, where people are coming in through the blog and they want to check out mode. Um, the place where it is useful is sometimes people would come to mode because they found it and, and, you know, they basically found mode through it and they're like, Oh, that's kind of how they became aware of it. More than that. It was, it was like useful when we were in sales conversations that if someone had read it, who was evaluating mode, they, they had a little bit more sort of faith in mode as a business somehow, uh, despite, despite having read the blog. Um, and so th there, there are useful elements there where it's, it's not so much like a direct top of funnel type of thing. It is more that, that people are aware of the blog or aware of me and, and you get some like positive brand from that really around, around mode and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, I think it is not a, in terms of the other things I could be doing, it's probably the most useful thing I got, but that's more of a statement of like my inability to do anything useful uh, and not <laughs> the value of the block. <laughs> All right. So we're, uh, we're at the top of the hour here. One more question. And um, obviously uh, we're not going to be able to address this in the depth that probably a lot of people would like, but you know, the most recent blog post kind of talking about SQL generators, we yeah. have to at least touch on AI a little bit. Where do you see, AI and generative AI taking the BI and, and data industry in the future. And uh, in general, that's part one. And part two would be, you know, specifically for the data analyst role, there's been a lot of talk of like, what does this mean for data analysts? Do they become more important? Do they become less important? Do they change into something else? What are your thoughts on that? So on the, on the first one, I mean, my, my overarching thought on all of this is, it's a really new and novel thing. And the way that it'll change things is we have absolutely no idea. Like yeah. the way these sort of big technological shifts happen is a bunch of things happen that we don't anticipate. And then like products get built on top of those new things. Like it's very hard to imagine a lot of iPhone apps pre iPhone. Like you can't really anticipate 
it's, it's hard to like even conceive of something like TikTok that has so many different elements of it that are driven by the fact it's on a phone prior to a phone existing. And I think this will be a little bit of the same thing. What that means specifically for like BI generally, my, my rough belief in this is, and this is to some extent informed by, by the things we have learned from ThoughtSpot and, and kind of our own, you know, it goes both ways. We both believe this and that's one of the reasons ThoughtSpot was interesting and ThoughtSpot sort of has, has shown us how this is possible is it's a new way of interacting with data that like one of the people are naturally, I think, capable analysts that lots of people who do not work in titles that they are analysts or whatever, they're marketing managers, they're product managers, they're people in sales. They understand the domain really, really deeply, but it's hard to express the questions that they have in anything but English. Like the only API they have into data is I can talk about it. And that's yeah. why analytics teams work is because they can go talk to an analytics team and like there's a back and forth and they'll answer questions and they can, they can get somewhere. And so I think the way that this really potentially changes things is it provides an interface into data that is more accessible. Um, that doesn't mean like it's just bots writing SQL queries. I think there'll be a lot of work to make that interface actually do the thing you want it to do. But ultimately, I think if, if this is the, the big outcome here is people can interact and ask questions and sort of be analysts without any of the real technical ability that is required to like formulate something into how do I write a query against the table or even how do I manipulate it in Excel? Um, what does that mean for analysts? I, I think it's, it doesn't change that much, honestly, because a lot of like analytics things are also going to be stuff that, that you have to still partner with folks in the business to be able to do. Um, there will still be a lot of work to make these things set them up in the same way you have to set up BI tools. And I actually think I, this was sort of in the post last week. I think the way that these things are actually pretty good is they're creative. To an analyst, I think the the thing that it does better than like, it's not going to replace like a, I can just immediately write a SQL query as much is you ask it like, help me reason through this problem in a way where it's giving you ideas and it's like, it's generative. I actually think that's pretty good. And so I can see analysts using it as, as a co-pilot, but not like a GitHub coding co-pilot that I'm sure will be elements of that, but also just like an analytical one, one that is like helping me think through problems, helping me sort of draft ideas for why this event may have occurred and like what do i go do to investigate it so it's it's like the the robot that's helping a, a detective solve a crime not by like automatically running the dna test but by saying like hey i saw these things are connected like could that mean something you're like oh my god that might mean something uh, last question and thank you for that answer and uh from colin you write those entirely on friday morning I do not. Uh, there <laughs> more. There more happens on Friday morning than I would like. Uh, like the one, <laughs> the, the one last week, I I most of it was Friday morning, and it was like a you know there's a there's a panic moment there. Um, the roughly the writing process here, like ideally, is I basically will write like a brain dump of ideas Monday, Tuesday. It's essentially like thirty minutes of just like, um, spend a couple hours trying to turn it into something coherent spend a couple hours the next day, like editing it into something that actually might be coherent and then panic rewriting the whole thing on Friday morning. Um, that's, that's roughly how it goes. Uh, and that has over time gotten more compressed where most of it happens like in two days rather than five. Uh, but, but usually they get started. Usually I started them like Wednesday night or Thursday morning and then yeah, finish them two minutes before they get sent out. Uh, which, you know, isn't, isn't great for anybody. <laughs> but, All right. Yeah, such a deadline. So we're, uh, we're a little past the hour here, Ben, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was really fun having you and, and congratulations again on, on the acquisition. Uh, really exciting. Where should we've talked about? There we go. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> so where should people reach you? They can follow you at, at ben.substack.com. That's the blog we've been talking about. If you're not familiar, I, I highly recommend you check it out. Subscribe. Every Friday, uh, fresh new insights from Ben. Where else can people reach you if they're interested? Um, Twitter and LinkedIn, I guess. Email. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a mode email that will, I guess, start forwarding things to another email address. Um, it's ben at mode.com. Um, there's a much longer one at ThoughtSpot. Um, I did Twitter is just Ben Stancil, LinkedIn. I don't know. I guess we have do we, are LinkedIn handles is probably Ben dot Stancil. And if not, you can <laughs> just search for Ben Stancil. He's the first one that will come up. Thing. Yeah. There's a hockey player with this, this name is Jamie Ben with two N's and he has sniped all of my 
been Google results. So <laughs> I, I have not, cannot compete with the NHL. <laughs> great. Um, well, thank you again for coming on, Ben. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. All right. Um, what a great guest. You're muted, bro. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> It's funny on this show when I call him bro, like he's actually my brother. It's true. Um, all right. So, um, hey, if you're new here, why don't you go ahead and uh, follow us, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, this is not just a LinkedIn show. It is also a YouTube show. It's simulcast to both. And you can always catch our back catalog of great interviews and shows at youtube.com slash C slash Super Data Brothers. So check us out there. Next week mystery uh next week we have um well i was going to play on the on the outro um we've got symphony analytics coming on today's show sponsor by the way check them out at symphonyanalytics.io listen if you are sick of combining assets from your bi tools you know your tableau and your power bi and your other tools to put together presentations or you have this need to collaborate across bi tools which i know at a lot of large companies that i've worked with over the career, my career as a consultant and working in analytics software, I know a lot of people have this problem, okay? So if you have this problem, check out symphonyanalytics.io. They can help you solve it. Bring your data into one collaborative canvas and get people talking about what matters, which is not the chart, it's the outcome, right? All right, any last words, Eric? No, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, tune in next week, same time every week. Um, when we're in Kenya, we'll try. We'll see if we can do a live, a live show from Kenya. We're but we'll have we'll, we'll have something stream. We'll have something streaming <laughs> while we're <laughs> we'll gone. We'll do our best. Uh, we'll we'll do right. our best. It'd be really cool to go from Kenya, though. Yeah, we're we're gonna try. All right. Until yeah. next week, everybody. I am Ryan, and I am Eric, and we are the Super Data Brothers. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.